All right, let's do this. Welcome to a Hall of Fame version of the Roncast. A triple shot of great interviews on this edition. All three guests are enshrined in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I've got a classic discussion with original Alice Cooper guitarist Michael Bruce, Def Leppard founder and frontman Joe Elliott, and I'm kicking it off with a recent discussion with guitarist for Def Leppard, Whitesnake, Dio, and his passion project, Last in Line, with some great bonus commentary from Vivian Campbell that you're only going to hear on the Roncast. Give up the ghost, brand new from Last in Line, a band formed by the original members of Dio, and now really coming into their own with the release of their second album. They're out on tour, tearing it up in the Northeast U.S. this week, both as a headliner and supporting UFO. And I'm joined right now by Last in Line guitarist. He's a Rock and Roll Hall of Famer with his other band, Def Leppard, and he's on the streets of rock and roll this week. Hello, Vivian Campbell. Great to talk to you. Thanks for the call. Thanks for having me on, Ron. It's my pleasure, man. It really seems like with this new album, Last in Line is making a push for legitimacy beyond being just a side project. The second album, you guys are out there busting your asses on the road. What does being in this band mean to you personally? Um, you know, we are working hard, I gotta say. Um, the last couple of years in particular, when I'm when I'm not working with Def Leppard, I'm working with Last in Line. We're we're making the effort, you know, we're getting out and playing the shows and playing as many shows in many places as we can. Um it's it's a grind. <laughs> but but the mus the music is the reward, you know. Um the band plays amazingly, they're incredible musicians. I'm very fortunate to get to play with them. Um it really it scratches an itch for me as a rock guitar player. You know, it gets back to where I started. You know, uh, Holy Diver was my first album back in the early 80s. And um, it, it's it's very cathartic to get out there and, and play those songs uh, together with, uh, as you mentioned, music from our, our two original albums. And uh, it's just, you know, it's a joy. It makes me very, very happy. It's, it's really, really hard work but it's something I, I'm happy to do because it fulfills me as a musician and I really believe in the band and I uh, I want us to, to get to that next level. You know, we're already, um, I'd say about 80% into writing songs for what will be our third album. We're hoping to get in the studio by January or February of next year and get a record out sometime in 2020. And uh, we're probably going to be on a different label too. We're hoping to go to a major label and, and up our game, and, and that's very exciting for us because you know we do, we do the hard work. A lot of these uh, cities and a lot of these venues we're going back to for a second or even a third time, you know. So we want to kind of get up there to that next level and, and move into theaters. Maybe get a stronger support slot. Uh, we want to get to Europe next year and, and do some of the bigger festivals and stuff, and, and really kind of grow the band, you know. Wow, that's great. From what I gather, Vivian, the last in line creative process is very organic, old school. Bunch of guys in a room, jamming together, creating music. Talk about this songwriting process and why it's working for you guys. It's uh, it's what we know. Um, it's how we we did the early Dio albums with Ronnie. Um, when both Ronnie and, and Jimmy Bain were alive, uh, you know, we'd just go into a room. Um, in fact, you probably know this room really well. It's Sound City. You remember original oh, yeah. Sound City Studios? Absolutely, man. So, um, yeah, so we, we'd, we'd go into the, the rehearsal rooms in there for a few weeks, and, and we'd just we'd, we'd kick around ideas. You know, I'd have a riff, or, or Jimmy'd have a riff, or sometimes Vinny would just start playing a monster beat, and we'd get inspired, and we'd, we'd just kind of, kick things around the room, you know, and eventually we, we'd come up with something and, and we'd play it to Ronnie and Ronnie would make suggestions and change this or shorten that or make that longer and, and then he'd go to his lyric books and uh, step up to the mic and start singing something. I mean, it happened very organically and it happened really, really quickly. Um, and we worked the same way with Andy. You know, unfortunately, we, we lost Jimmy in early 2016, right before our, our first album, Heavy Crown, came out. And, uh, you know, we've had Phil Suzanne in the band ever since then. We've done a load of shows with Phil, and, and Phil has really pushed us as as, uh, as a writer. He's a very ambitious bass player and, and kind of pushed us musically. And, uh, you know, he, he's adapted very well to, to work in, in that way with us, you know, just going in and, and kicking around ideas. And uh, so it, it's a very different process to how Def Leppard writes. I mean, Leppard 
is not a jam band. You know, when when you write songs for Def Leppard, it has to be very specific. And, you know, it's just a very different animal. Um, they're two extremely different bands. And uh, this is what works for Last in Line. Like I said, it doesn't work for Def Leppard. But it's uh, it's a different kind of thing. And, and it's for me, it, it's... Um, it's comfortable because that's that's how I started. I mean, that's how we did the Holy Diver album. That's how we did the original Last in Line album. That's how we did Sacred Heart. You know, it's, it's a process that works for, for this band. Well told and well said about that contrast between the Def Leppard writing process and the Last in Line process. I'm speaking with Hall of Fame guitarist Vivian Campbell. Vivian, we've all seen Def Leppard many times these past couple of decades since you've been in the band. And you and Phil Cullen, an amazing twin guitar team. The rhythm patterns and the solos are arranged and orchestrated, executed to perfection. But I'm guessing with Last in Line, you're enjoying being the guy, being the lead guitar player in the band like the old days. Yeah, I mean... You know, the, the Leopard show is very concise. It's very, very high tech, very high production quality. Um, there's zero improvisation going on in a Leopard show. I mean, it, it's very well executed and uh, machine like, if you like. And our vocals are all live. And that's, that's a real challenge for us to replicate. Def Leppard records, yeah. you know, vocally in, in a live environment. And then we take great pride in that, in the fact that we can do it and, and we do it very, very well. And, uh, you know, so that, that's something I've really come along as a singer, you know, even prior to, to joining Leopard, I always wanted to sing. I remember even back with, with the original Dio band, I, I went to Ronnie and I said, can I sing background vocals? And, and he shot down that idea really, really <laughs> quick. He, he said he said to me, he, he waved his finger in my face and he said, singers sing, guitar players play guitar. He said, Tony Iommi never sang. He said, Tony Iommi never sang. Richie Blackmore never sang. You're not singing. And wow. I was, oh, okay. <laughs> so, and by contrast, you know, I, I was with Whitesnake for a couple of years and, and, and David... Coverdale was was very very encouraging of of my my nascent um, vocalizing. You know, I was starting to take vocal lessons, and he turned me on to his vocal coach and actually gave me a few tips and kind of grew it from then. And by the time I I stepped in and auditioned with Def Leppard when I joined the band in 1992, um, I was actually you know a reasonable vocalist. I was coming along, and I, I'm happy to say that in the 27 or so years since. I've gotten to be really good at it. Um, now, having said that, I don't sing at all in last in line. It is a it is a contrast because I'm the only um, melodic instrument, if you like, in the band. It's just we don't have right. a keyboard player anymore. We're just guitar, bass, drums, and vocals. So, so I'm doing all the heavy lifting in the guitar world, and I just really want to focus on that. You know, that was my first passion, and and it, it's kind of come around full circle to that with this band it, it really is an outlet for me to to just put my head down and just get back to murdering my les paul like i did when i was 17 you know so the the, the leopard thing you know the the twin guitars of, of myself and phil and def leopard is is a different kind of thing i mean the rhythm parts are very intricate and, and challenging in their own way especially when you're singing at the same time a lot of it you know, you, you know yourself when you're trying to play something that's a different rhythm from what you're trying to sing yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's right brain, left brain at the same time. So a, a lot of that just takes a lot of practice. Um, but it, it's, like I said, the leopard thing is very, very precise, very well executed. And, and the vocal is the main thing that I'm focusing on when I'm with Def Leppard because we're all singing in every song. Um, and, you know, so it, it's a nice contrast. I, I feel very fortunate that I get to play in two exceptional bands that are just very, very, very different. And, and I get a chance to discuss to exercise these different muscles, you know? Well, in contrast, you spoke about the contrast in writing and in the production slash performance element. Also, man, with Def Leppard and that massive arena production and touring with Last in Line and a scaled down, lean and mean approach to grinding it out on the road, how does that uh, resonate with you? As, as a, I think it's got to feel good to go back to the roots, still be paying dues and, and doing it on a smaller scale. It is, but <laughs> I, I'll be perfectly candid here and say I'm, I'm glad I don't have to do it all the time. You know, it, it's it's nice to go back to playing arenas and stadiums with Def Leppard and, you know, eating something other than a cheese sandwich every day. It's, you know, the the level at which Last in Line is touring is, is very, very grueling. It's, it's, we don't 
have a lot of money at this level. You know, we're playing clubs and small theaters and uh, we're driving in a van <laughs> every day and, you know, doing multiple shows back to back. So <clears throat> I, I do enjoy it. Yeah, it, it's it's kind of masochistic in a way, but, um, you know, I, I, I am fortunate that, that I'm not relying on it. <laughs> I get it, man. I get it. it. Cer- I'm, cer- I'm cer- certainly not doing it for the money, put it that way, you know, but it's it, there's there's a lot more to life than money, and um, I'm I'm very fortunate that that uh, my my career has treated me well, and and I'm in a position where I I can indulge doing this, you know, um, and it is something I want to do. Like I said earlier, I really believe in this band and Last in Line, and and um, I'm encouraged, you know, to see it kind of grow over the years, and, and I'm really looking forward to to 2020 and, and getting our third album out, and and actually, you know, stepping up the game and and. Uh, expanding the reach of the band, you know, because it really, really is a, a great experience. I mean, to see live musicians play in real time is is a dying art in this day and age. And, and to see musicians of the caliber of of the guys in this band, you know, is is quite exceptional. I think, and it's, it's a very joyous communal experience for those that get to see us. You know, well, your enthusiasm is infectious, and your work ethic is relentless, man. Going from the Def Leppard gigs straight into Last in Line. How much has your battle with Hodgkin's lymphoma motivated you to keep the pedal down, so to speak, and live life and enjoy the music at this accelerated pace? Yeah, I mean, that really <clears throat> definitely kind of set something off in me. You know, I've, I've always been a, a glass half empty, sorry, sorry, half full kind of guy. You know, I mean, I always tried to look at the positive aspects of what life was giving me. Um, and, you know, when I got my cancer diagnosis back in 2013, you know, once you get over the initial shock of it, and you, you kind of just, um, I think you have two choices when, when life gives you something like that. You can either see it head on or you can give into it and slowly start to pass away. You know, uh, I definitely have been fighting it the entire time. I refuse to, to capitulate the cancer in any way, shape, or form. Um, and it, it kind of it lit a bit of a fire under my ass. I'd say, you know, I, I kind of thought, okay, well, there's an expiration date here, yeah. so let's get yeah. on, you know. And I, you know, I just I all I ever wanted to do in my life was be a guitar player in a rock band, and, and now I, I play in two exceptional bands, and I'm I'm happy to do as much as possible. Uh, having said that, the last couple of years have just been very, very, very intense for me schedule wise. So I I will um, schedule a holiday sometime Good for, for you. <laughs> I, I've learned the, the the importance of that that you have to actually schedule some time off. Otherwise, you know, January rolls around. And I look at the calendar and I realize that every single week of the year I'm working. You know, so um, I'll take a holiday next year. You do Go that, ahead. man. Well deserved. And on behalf of rockers everywhere, we're extremely thankful for your health and your massive contribution to modern hard rock music. Find them online at lastinlineofficial.com. My very special guest this week, rock and roll hall. Of famer vivian campbell wishing you all the best in life and music thanks for coming on the show have a great gig tonight appreciate it ron thank you very much okay viv a couple of extra questions for the podcast version if you don't mind if you have a minute yeah sure all right vivian campbell on the ron cast couple of uh off-center questions viv how do you feel about cell phones in the air at every show that we do uh, it's it's really annoying. I gotta say, um, you know, I, I just I don't understand it. You know, I, I don't understand why people don't want to experience and be in the moment. I mean, that's that's what life is really about. Is about uh, appreciating the the moment that you have. You know, with with people, with other people, with community, with family, with friends, uh, with live music, you know, real musicians playing real music in a room in real time. That's that's a great, joyous, communal experience. Um, I understand that people want something to post on social media or some sort of memento from it, but by by watching this show through your cell phone, it just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And I, when you listen back to it the next day, it's going to sound like shite. So... I, I don't get it, you know. Um, and uh, also, you know, the whole social media thing, I, I think, can be very, very intrusive. I mean, I, I find people taking cell phone videos of us all the time, even when we're trying to, you know, scratch our bum or do something. Yeah. You know, it's just, I, I, I appreciate 
uh, human interaction. I also appreciate a little bit of civility and a little bit of privacy, so I'm not a fan of it. I agree and totally concur, man. I I don't understand why they, it, it annoys the performers and it annoys everybody else in the audience except the one guy who's who's doing it and posting the video next the next day on YouTube. Uh, another question for you, mm-hmm. Vivian. Athletes, actors, and musicians making political statements. Where do you stand on that? Um, yeah, that's this is a tricky one. Um, I, I think everyone is entitled to an opinion, um, but unfortunately, I think we live in very polarizing times. Yeah. So, uh, I, I personally, I mean, like, I had a personal Facebook page that I, I haven't been on for a few years because I did express, you know, um, opinions beyond music uh, because it was a personal page, and you know, the the, the blowback was just brutal and intense. I think, you know. There's a lot of uh, civility and, and human interaction and discourse uh, has has gone in the gutter, you know, thanks to people communicating in, in these very indirect ways through social media. Um, I think we're getting pulled into uh, a time when people have to make that hard choice. Um, you know, even corporations, like even look what's happening with the, the NBA and China at the moment. Yeah. You know, because, uh, you know, so does the NBA and, and the huge corporations like Nike that, that make a fortune with, with uh, concurrent with the NBA. I mean, do they take a political stand on this? Uh, I think it's important. Yeah. Um, I think you kind of have to. I think people are starting to vote their politics with their pocketbooks, you know, like, uh, you know, issues like gun control and um and, you know, gender association and equal equal rights for people. You know, I think some corporations are, are defining themselves by by getting involved in politics. It, it's a very, very complex issue. And uh, I don't think there's an easy answer to it. And I, I think um, it, it, it's a very dangerous time for any sort of a celebrity, be you an actor or athlete or musician, to... to to draw a line in the sand on that, you know, um, with, with Def Leppard, you know, one thing that, that, uh, Joe said to me when I joined the band many, many years ago, um, and this was way before the, the current political climate, you know, he said that Def Leppard has always been about escapism. He says, we don't write political songs. You know, we don't, um, proselytize. We don't preach to people. We, we want to offer escapism, you know, like, um, like a Spielberg movie, you know, just, just kind of like where people can lose themselves in something and get away from all of that real world stuff. And so I, I do think there's a lot to be said for that, you know, and Def Leppard as a band, you know, we are very much apolitical. We just offer entertainment, you know, but as individuals, you know, when we're back in the dressing room, we all have political views and, and we all have moral stances on things, but it, it's, it's a very, very <laughs> dangerous thing to, to to use your um your your pulpit if you like you know to use your 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 stature in the world to to try and tell other people how to live um but ultimately i think you know as as people we all get through this i just think we're in a very very ugly time at the moment where we're uh i think our leadership in in a lot of the world not just in this country has, has kind of brought us into the gutter and is trying to exploit the differences that we have. But I think that as, as human beings, we all have a lot more in common than we have that separating us, you know? I mean, everyone has family, everyone bleeds red, you know, regardless of the color of your skin. Everyone just wants to be safe and secure and loved. And I think, you know, as people, we need to learn how to communicate better. And, and as a musician, um, you know, I I don't, want to preach i i just want to play guitar and then hopefully music will help heal i find music to be very cathartic um especially in times of stress and and so i'll do what i can as a musician to bring people together and, and try and um hopefully help people realize that that, that love is a, a, a stronger emotion than hatred Excellent commentary. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Vivian Campbell on the Roncast and on the streets of rock and roll. Best of luck in life, love, and music, my friend. And uh, I hope to talk to you again very soon. Thank you, Ron. It's been a pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you, Vivian. Goodbye, bye. Fight Like a Band. The new album from Ron Keel Band has hit the streets. 
and new original songs. New versions of the Keel Classics. Keel's a player. Available worldwide from EMP, Outlaw Records, Amazon, iTunes, RonKeelBand.com. If you're going to take on the world. Like a band. From one Hall of Fame guitarist to another, this interview originally aired on the streets of rock and roll on May 7th, 2014. And it was a big deal for me then. And it's a big deal for me now. I grew up in the 70s living in Alice Cooper's hometown of Phoenix, Arizona. I played in an Alice Cooper tribute band when I was 15 years old. And I also played in a band with a cat named Paul Bruce. His brother happened to be Michael Bruce from the original Alice Cooper band. So the ties that bind me to the Alice Cooper legend are significant. And in 2014, I was able to track down the reclusive guitarist, Living in Mexico, Michael Bruce from the Alice Cooper Band. I got him on the phone, and this happened. Everybody knows my history with Gene Simmons and Kiss, and most people realize that Kiss took a huge cue from the band that truly created the rock and roll spectacle, Alice Cooper. And I have on the line, founding member and original guitarist for the Alice Cooper Band, Rock and Roll Hall of Famer, Michael Bruce. Michael, thanks for being on the show, man. How are you? Hey, Ron, I'm good, I'm good. Great to have How you. How are you, buddy? I'm awesome, man. It's really a pleasure to talk to you. And, and there's so much I'd like to hit on in this conversation, but there's only so much time. So let's start with what has to be one of the biggest moments in any rock star's career. Uh, I saw you and Alice and the band get inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame a few years back, and it was obviously a very emotional experience. Can you take us back that evening? Uh, what was it like, man? Oh, it's really amazing. Um, we uh, we went down there early and started rehearsing. Uh, actually, the... The rehearsal for the whole thing took <laughs> more time than the actual induction. But uh, we uh, did a lot of prep and uh, went over with the cameras and whatnot. And then when we got up there and we're playing away, I look up and the table right in front of me, I'm looking at Neil Young and, you know, one of my idols. Wow. And, uh, and Bob Gildorf, uh, God, I can't, I can't, I'm trying to think of all the people that were there, but it was, it was incredible. And uh, we did, I think, three songs under my wheels. Uh, school was out in 18. It was a great night. Well, congratulations, man. Uh, amazing uh, story and amazing experience. The surviving members of that original Alice Cooper band, yourself, uh, Dennis Dunaway, and Neil Smith, you guys have reunited with Alice on stage a few times in recent years, and you guys all participated in the Welcome to My Nightmare recording. Uh, it was released in 2011 as a sequel to the original album. Did it kind of feel like you were picking up where you left off? And how would you characterize your relationship with Alice today? Now uh, we're we we speak, you know, where everything is good, you know, uh I'm the man behind the snake and uh he lets me carry his golf clubs once in a while, but uh, just kidding. Right. Uh, but, good uh, color, man. Whenever whenever he needs quality and uh uh, and find musicianship. He called me on the dentist and myself. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, well, in doing some research for the interview, I, I went back and revisited those YouTube clips. It looks like you're having a blast whenever you're playing. Uh, so uh, I, I was really happy to see that stuff. You know, a new this new documentary film called Super Duper Alice Cooper. It's just been released, and it's making a lot of noise, selling out really all over the country. I haven't seen the film, but I did read somewhere that Dennis and Neil were both interviewed for the movie. Did they speak to you as well? Uh, no, they didn't. Uh, I live down in the San Carlos, Mexico, and I'm pretty hard to get a hold of. Uh, they may have tried to reach me. I don't know. But, you know, I, I look at it this way. I've done enough interviews, uh, and uh, I, you know, and Dennis speak for me anytime. Well, I, I'm glad to, that I got a hold of you, and I'm really glad for the opportunity to interview <laughs> you. Uh, this is the Streets of Rock and Roll. We've got legendary Hall of Fame guitarist Michael Bruce from the original Alice Cooper Band on the line. And, uh, Michael, you've stayed uh, musically active these past few decades with the Michael Bruce Band and other projects. 1996, you wrote and released the book No More Mr. Nice Guy, the inside story of the Alice Cooper Group. Man, what are you up to these days in life and in music, besides living in Mexico and living the high life? Well, uh... I actually have been working with uh, Billy James, who uh, he was uh, helped me get out the first film, of Mr. Nice Guy, published that, and uh, we're thinking about re- releasing a updated version of No More Mr. Nice Guy, the book, and then I, I think I've got uh, one more CD left in me at least, and uh, I'm going to try to get that out this fall. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm thinking about releasing it uh, on vinyl only. 
which would be interesting. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, vinyl's making a big comeback, man. There's a lot of hardcore vinyl files out there that uh, that love that stuff. Absolutely. Um, do you have a website or a place uh, online where fans can find you? Uh, Facebook, I think it's Michael O. Bruce uh, at uh, 18. Michael, Michael O. Bruce 18, I, I, I believe it's... Uh, I have a website, you have a Facebook page. Right on. Well, all the listeners, make sure you uh, just go to Facebook, search Michael Bruce 18. You'll find this guy uh, alive and well and kicking ass. Uh, I'm a huge fan, Michael. We grew up in the same town, and in Phoenix, you guys were like rock gods. that We all looked up to playing on the local scene. In fact, as I mentioned off the air, I played in a band with your brother, Paul Bruce, in 1975, and I hope you'll pass on my regards as well as my contact information if you like. I'm at ronkeel.com. I'd love to reconnect with him. How's he doing? He's doing good. As a matter of fact, I just took a uh, a new keyboard over to him, and he's still playing keys, and uh, he's playing with a friend of his, and uh, they hope to maybe get up a little duo uh, and play around uh, town. That's awesome. And he gave me a shot when I was 14 years old playing drums and uh, without even an audition. My first gig, I'm on stage at the Arizona State Fair with, with Michael and a singer called Jeremy Cloud. I don't know if you remember that guy, but it was a, yes, a, a yes, yes, I great, remember, yes. great front man and, and a big influence on me. Wallace and Ladmo. That's right. That's right. And, yeah. you know, Michael, I hear that you have a, an interesting story about Keith Moon playing drums on your solo album. Yes, yes. Uh, well, uh, Pete, you know, was a, was a fun-loving guy, and yeah. uh, he, I told uh, I told a road manager, I said, get Keith whatever he wanted, and when I came back into, uh, came back into the studio, it sounded like they had a lot of delay on the song, and, and Keith was actually playing behind uh, the beat, uh, but in time, but behind the beat, and uh, and I asked him, I said, why do you have so much delay? He says, no, that's no delay, he's just playing. He's, I guess he drank both bottles before he started playing, so... Unfortunately, we couldn't use the track, but he had a good time. Wow. Well, nowadays, you could have just taken that in Pro Tools and kind of moved the drums around and put them where they belong. Exactly, man. exactly. Great story, man. We just Great had story. to move the drummer around instead. <laughs> wow, awesome, man. I, I can't thank you enough for your time. And I uh, want to thank, thank you for uh, all the great music through the years and for being an influence on guys like me and an entire generation of rock and rollers, man. Rock and Roll Hall of Famer. Well, thank you, Ron. Thank you, buddy. Michael Bruce from the Alice Cooper Band, Rock and Roll Hall of Famer. Best wishes. Thanks so much for coming on the program, buddy. Cool out forever. How cool is that? I think my interviewing skills have come a long way since that conversation, but I treasure that 12-plus minutes of glory, and I'm glad to share it with you on the Roncast. Quick pause for the Jaws and Joe Elliott on deck. You got it. The right to shop at the coolest store on the planet, specializing in all things 80s and 90s. Retroactive in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, is celebrating their 15th anniversary this summer, and I'll be there on Saturday, July 18th to help mark this epic occasion. Movies, music, memorabilia, and more. Retroactive has it all, and I can't wait to rock out and shop hard. I'll be there for photos, autographs, I'll play some music, sing some tunes, basically shop all night and party all day. Congratulations to store owner Amy Leonard on 15 great years. Here's to many more. Go online at shopretroactive.com. I'll see you in Myrtle Beach at Retroactive on Saturday, July 18th. I had Hall of Fame vocalist Joe Elliott on the streets of rock and roll in 2014 to promote his side project, Down and Outs. You could just feel his passion for rock and roll, for his all-time favorite band, Mott the Hoople, and for this Down and Outs project. They have a new album out, making big noise on the charts, so check that out at Down N, the letter N, Down N Outs with a Z, O-U-T-Z, Down and Outs dot net. And enjoy this interview with Def Leppard's Joe Elliott. That's rock and roll queen from a band called Down and Outs. That's Outs with a Z. You may recognize that voice. He sold over 100 million albums as the front man for Def Leppard. Joe Elliott, welcome to the streets of rock and roll, man. Hey, how are you? Great seeing you in Nashville couple of weeks ago and uh, great to have you on the show i know you're extremely busy this summer so we appreciate you taking the time 
No problem at all. We're actually on a five-day break at the moment, so it's nice to be able to just uh, kick back and do a bit of talking as opposed to screaming my head off all night, you know. That's great, man. Well, it's, it's nice to have you on the show to talk to Rock. Uh, we will talk some Def Leppard. That's the mothership for you, but I know we're both excited to talk about your other project, Down and Outs. A couple of months back, you guys released your third installment, The Further Adventures of... We just heard the first single, Rock and Roll Queen. The new single, One of the Boys, hit this week. There's a special inspiration behind this band. Tell us what Down and Outs is all about. Well, Down and Outs is it's an accident, actually. It, was a complete, it wasn't one of those things where I said, you know, I just woke up one day and decided to start another band. Mop and Opal were just my thing as a kid. You know, most of us, and I mean, fairness, I love them too, but most of us, it's always the Beatles, the Stones, or Zeppelin, or something like that, Sabbath, or whatever, if you're a Brit, you know. But for me, Mop were just the thing that, I don't know what it was, the underdog in me, like in this band that kind of, it was really always on the uphill struggle, and then they had this hit that Bowie gave them with all the young dudes. They were just my band, and I've been their cultural ambassador for the best part of 30 odd years. And they decided to reform in 2009 for a series of five shows in London at the legendary Hammersmith Odeon. And um, I got the call. They, they all, I've met them all over the years. They all know. And they all said, look, you know, just as a thanks, we want you involved. Um, open for us on the last night. I'm like, well, what, how? You know, I mean, I can't get Leopard to do it. That's just they'll just be unbalanced and so uh, the promoter guy said well I also look after the choir boys and they'd be well up for doing it so they volunteered their services to be the band and uh, even Spike I got the, the singer I got steamed up to do one song and I moved over on the piano and so I said okay well this is what we're going to do what do I want to see us do if I'm a Mott the Hoople fan sitting in the front row I thought you know what when they split in 74 the, the band got a new singer in, abbreviated the name to Mott, made two albums. They, they morphed into a band called British Lions and made two albums. And all the while, Ian Hunter was doing solo stuff. I'm going to cherry pick some of my favorite Splinter stuff that they did after they split. And that's what we did. And it was a 45-minute one-off performance, which I thought, because it was a one-off, I'm going to have this DVD, I'm going to film this, and, and it's just for prosperity, if nothing else. And um, so we did the show, went great, kids loved it, um, so much so, the 30 minutes interval, we went to the public bar and pretty much got like pinned to the wall by all these kids going, you've got to record this stuff. You know, I can't believe what I've heard. I didn't think I'd ever hear these songs live again, you know, because they hadn't been played live since, what, 76, 77? Yeah. And the, the songs never get played on the radio. So essentially, to anybody who wasn't there at the time, these are new songs. And we, uh, I just said to the guys, I said, well, look, you know, it's, it, it's fresh in the DNA right now. Do you want to go in and record them? And they went, yeah, we've got a couple of weeks off. Let's go and do it, you know. So we made the, we basically recorded the, the, the 10 songs that we played live, and that was the essence of the first album. I did a couple of instrument, uh, acoustic things to, just to throw in and uh, vary up a bit. Um, but essentially, it was just a case of going and doing the songs the way we did them live, and that was the first album. But, you know, we put it out, thinking, well, okay, that 300 kids that cared will buy it, and that's all that's going to happen. But no, you know, the, we, England Rocks started getting a lot of traction on American air, uh, uh, radio stations and, and hit top five on the media base rock chart, and then the Night Angels, lo and behold, hit number one, keeping Clapton off the top. These are all the facts that I've been given by my girl, you know, and it's like, really? The down and outs are just keeping Eric Clapton off the top spot. Are you kidding me? Wow. I just didn't think that this was that kind of a project. So from from a, a one-off saying, yes, I'd love to open for you guys. It'd be an honor because you're my favorite band and I understand why you want me to do it. It's gone on to becoming now a legitimate band you know we've we were second on the bill on the inaugural uh i voltage festival in london in 2010 in front of what thirty five thousand. we opened for paul rogers on a on a tour of britain uh three years ago we've got a british tour in december uh headlining on our own i'd love to do some shows in the states one day when i get a chance we'd love that uh, too man and we've got the new single out today you know one of the boys is, is out this week the video hit yesterday 
And uh, it's like, you know, it's just an extension of me more than anything else, but it's a fun one. It's not, it's a labor of love, but it's not really labor. You know, it's like, this is easy for me. It's like a lot yeah, of people spend like a, a lot of time now. mountaineering and stuff. Well, that's hard work <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. Going in the studio and recording some of my favorite ever songs is easy. Def Leppard vocalist Joe Elliott on the phone with me talking about his other band, The Down and Outs. I want to give out the websites. This guy's not hard to find online. Go to joeelliot.com. Down and Outs. That's down, the letter N, outs with a Z. Downandouts.com. Of course, defleppard.com. And also, we'll put up links to those sites at my place, which is ronkeel.com. Hang in, hang out, hang on. Lots more after this. Back on the streets of rock and roll, I'm your host, Ron Keel. I'm hanging out on the phone with Def Leppard's Joe Elliott, talking about his other band, Down and Outs, which, Joe, in a very special way, you're paying tribute to your all-time favorite band, Mott the Hoople. How cool is it that you got overwhelming approval from not only the fans, but also from Ian and the guys in Mott the Hoople as well? You know, The man, Ian Hunter, 75 years old, still out there rocking on tour, man, kind of gives a lot of hope to guys our age. No, well, he's, the guy is a phenomenal. I mean, I don't know how he does it. Uh, most people are 75 feet up, armchair, watching sports. <laughs> yeah. You know, the guy, is, he's, he's going on tour again this year, and he's, he plays like a two, two and a half hour set, you know. His, his last album came out in 2000, and I think, 12, 2011, 2012, uh, when I'm president, and it was his highest ever solo chart show in, in the UK. At the age of 73. I mean, that was just a fun... His first solo record, the one with One Spin Twice Shy on it, which was following right on the back of Mother Hoople's demise, so he was still kind of well-known and in the press all the time. I think he reached number 17 on the British uh, album charts, and when I'm president, he reached number 15. And it was like, really? You know, I mean, after all this time, it does give everybody hope, you know. The fact that he's a phenomenal songwriter really helps because that keeps your finger in, you know. I mean, it's, it, anybody can just kind of keep scouting around and finding label after label, getting smaller and smaller to put out whatever nonsense you write. But he doesn't write nonsense. He writes phenomenal songs, great writer. He's right up there with Dylan as far as I'm concerned. Um, he, he's, he's got great melody, great hooks. He knows his rock and roll. He knows his ballads. And he's just got a, he's a great character. That's the thing about Ian. He's not a, he's not a singer in the in the vein of Paul Rogers, David Coverdale, Lou Graham. He's a he's he's a portrayer of lyrics in the same vein as a, as a Bob Dylan or, or anybody else that just you know gets the point across. He, he's got a style, and when you hear him, you go like Ian Hunter, and that's way more important than being the best lounge singer in the world or the guy that can sing Bud Budweiser ads and stuff you know much rather hear a, a Steve Marriott or a who was a phenomenal singer yeah. in fairness but there's, there's a guy from a British band called the Heavy Metal Kids whose name was Gary Holton wasn't the best singer in the world but the character was phenomenal David Johansson from the New York Dolls phenomenal but not what you'd call a great Mick Jagger Mick Jagger's yeah. not exactly a singer but um, he's fantastic you know he's, he's, he's probably the most famous of the lot but doesn't sing the way that say you could never get a job in foreigner, you know. But uh, it, it wouldn't want one, I probably imagine. But uh, it's you know everybody's different. The thing with Ian is he's he's got his own style, and that's so much more important than just being a phenomenal singer. It's yeah, you got to you got to have that style, and you got to have the rock and roll in your heart, man. Uh, you listen to Ozzy Osbourne. You know, you can put Ozzy front in Sabbath, or you can put Ozzy over the London Philharmonic Orchestra. The second he opens his mouth, you go, "That's Ozzy Osbourne." And yeah. that is so much more important than being like, oh, that's a fantastic vocal. Who is it? I have no idea. 75, incredible. Absolutely incredible. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know about you, Joe, but I might not be on tour in my 70s, man. How about you? I don't know. <laughs> I, uh, I, I, the, the, the closer I get to it, it's uh, come Friday, 15 years away for me. You know, Jagger's yeah. 71. Uh, and you just don't know this day and age. I mean, 70 might be the new 50. That's and 50 right. is obviously the new 21. So if who you, knows what's going to happen in 15 years' time. If you asked us 20 years ago, we probably would have said that we wouldn't be on tour in our 50s either. But I was at your gig in Nashville a couple of weeks back. Great show. How's it been this summer touring with Kiss? 
fantastic. Those guys are so easy to work with because it's not work, is it? You know, I mean, we meet in the middle. You know, we both kind of arrive at the gig at the same time. They go off to do their meet and greet. We go off to do ours. We we do our show. They get ready. We meet in the corridor. We tell jokes. We, you know, we've travelled together uh, on occasions. Um, we've we we haven't sat down for a meal yet. We're hoping to get something going, like a barbecue or something, yeah. sometime on, on this second part of this, the, the tour. But that's such easy. All the all the kind of bowl that you go through. I think you're over it by the time you're in your fortieth year as a band. You know, you just move on. You just things don't bother you. Don't start throwing things around or get throwing tantrums. Things go wrong. You just deal with them because he won't be the first time sound them. It'll not be the last. But these guys don't have an agenda. We don't have an agenda. We're thirty five years in. They're forty years in. You know, and it's a case of like there's just massive amount of respect from both bands towards each each other. Um, so it's easy. You know, and, and it, it, musically it's a great contrast because there's a similarity but there's also a vast difference. Um, and that kind of juxtaposition somewhere in the middle is what's bringing in two lots of different fans. You know, I mean, there's a lot of Kiss fans that come not necessarily familiar or even that bothered about us and vice versa. But somewhere along the line, you kind of hope you, 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 you win some of them over. You just do, you know. We've won some Kiss fans over and now they said they've won some Leopard fans over. But there's a huge big chunk in the middle that like both and that's why there's so many people coming it's a it's that classic cliche of one and one makes three you know it's not great math but it's uh, it's great rock and roll Let, let's get back to the music for a minute or, or five this is the power ballad segment brought to you by bruner's metalware handcrafted metal and leather bracelets and cuffs one of my new sponsors you've got to check this stuff out at bruner's metalware.com that's two n's b-r-u-n-n-e-r-s bruner's metalware.com beautiful wrist wear for rockers our power ballad of the week one of my favorite Def Leppard recordings it was a bonus track from the 1995 greatest hits collection vault when love and hate collide on the streets of rock and roll Streets of Rock and Roll, where we talk the... Maybe we should just call it the Rod Keel Show. How about that? Otherwise known as the Ron Keel Show, because that Streets of Rock and Roll is getting to be quite the tongue twister. This is where we talk the rock and rock the talk. I'm Ron Keel, joined on the phone this week by Joe Elliott from Def Leppard and Down and Outs. Joe, you've got a lot going on hosting your own radio show at planetrock.com. You've got about a month left on the Def Leppard U.S. tour this summer with KISS in December, down and outs, hitting the road for a 10-day tour of the U.K. Man, how much fun is it getting away from the massive production of a huge Def Leppard concert and getting back to basics on stage with down and outs? I've seen a few video clips. It looks like you're having a blast. Well, that, the videos are shot at the Sheffield Corporation, which is one of the gigs that we're playing. So you can see the contrast between playing, say, um, a, tw- a 21,000 seat uh, amphitheater, which was where we started in Salt Lake City, um, where we broke the house record, um, to going to play in 550 to 700 seat uh, or standing beer stained tobacco stained <laughs> clubs in in the UK. The contrast couldn't be more different, you know, but the fun is going to be incredible because I have no problem getting down and dirty. To me, people will think, oh, you know, you fancy flying around in private jets and all this kind of stuff. I'm like, no, we're going to be in a splitter van with the gear, 12 people, band and crew, you know, um, and playing these crappy little clubs. And it, I'm really, it's like going camping for me. I'm just really looking forward to it. It's 10 days. I'm doing the honorable thing, which is promoting the record properly. I'd love to get the opportunity to do it in the States one day, but the problem is that both the Choir Boys and the Def Leppard are our day jobs, and they are extremely... Uh, they take a lot of time. You know, the Choir Boys are about to hit the States for a six-week tour. In fact, they're here in a couple of days' time. Um, we've got... Uh, an album to finish the second so as we we finished tour in mid-September and apart from a, a week's worth of gigs in October we've got an album to finish uh, so that we can get back out and do this all again next year so you've, very, you've got to really cherry pick every second yeah. you can to get this stuff in I could be very lazy and just not bother and just say oh, I'm just going to just go on and watch, watch soccer on TV but you know I think the fact that I am 55 next birthday and you, it's not that you think you're running out of time but you just don't want to waste any time that you do have 
and I've always I've always had that work ethic where it's like I'd rather be tired because I'm working too hard than tired because I've got sunburn. <laughs> yeah, I certainly respect that. It's man, just the know. way I am. You know, yeah. I, I, these opportunities you, you, they're they're a gift. You know, when you when you become me or you become anybody, whether it be Robert Plant or Paul McCartney or Sting or, or even Tom White, somebody that's sells that 200 feet of close. If you're still doing it after 30 years, it's your vocation. You were born to do it. You drifted into it somehow and you were very fortunate to get a break. That you were born with the tools to do this. It's just whether you've got the uh, inclination to keep it going. You know, I, I, I don't think you can train to be the best brain surgeon. I think that you can train to be the best brain surgeon if you were born with the tools to do the training. You can't just take any random six people and throw them in a, in a medical school and expect to get the best brain surgeon. The best brain surgeon would be the one that was born to be the best brain surgeon. And I think when it comes to music... I think that the ones like Ian Hunter was born to do what he does. He didn't just decide when he was 17 to do it. He did decide to do it, but he was born to make that decision, is what I'm saying. And I, I think that's what it is for me. And, and I, I don't like the idea of wasting this God-given gift that I was given where I can throw a few chords together and I can make the odd word rhyme here and there. And it's like people seem to enjoy what we do. And I'm not going to just let that go to waste. So I, every given opportunity, I try and come up with something creative because I believe that's what I was put on this planet to do. Well said, man. Joe Elliott from Def Leppard preaching to the choir. <laughs> Amen, brother. I didn't mean to sound so philosophical. I do apologize. Hey, that's, you know, you're going to roll there. <laughs> that's the important stuff, man. That's what people want to hear, and that's what the life that you guys like you and I live, man. So uh, yeah, I appreciate right. you uh, opening up like that. I live in Las Vegas. Def Leppard's been very successful bringing your Viva Hysteria show here to the Hard Rock. Uh, any plans for another residency gig here in Sin City? Absolutely, you know, and that was such a fantastic thing to do. Twenty-three nights in the same bed. <laughs> that was a big. The crowd went on tour. We didn't move. It was like this is amazing, you know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and you know, it was it's it's some job. I mean, we were you know we opened for ourselves as Dead Flatbird, playing as obscure stuff as we could. A few hits that were you know let's get rocked and stuff like that. But we were digging out old B sides that were thirty-three years old and playing this kind of bizarre eclectic opening set for ourselves and then having to get off, get changed and come back on as the million dollar Jeff Leopard for the hysteria thing. Um, two hours, 25 minutes with, of that for 11 shows. It was pretty intense, but it was such a vibe, you know, and they they loved us. We loved doing it. They want us back. Um, we have a specific date set that we'd love to do, whether we call it Viva Pyromania or which I don't know, but, you know, I think the logical thing to do next will be Pyromania. Um, work our way back you know I mean even on on Viva Siri if you watch the DVD and you look at the extras we played seven of the ten songs from High and Dry you know I mean so we really did go deep on that and it was a great opportunity because you know with a, a tour like this Death Leopard Kiss tour you just don't have the time to do that you know we're, we're both I mean they're really cramming hits and there's not really much much room for I don't want to call it fluff but you know yeah, kind of yeah. the hardcore fans that want to say hey man have you ever played anything like our fog tour tonight we go yeah we have but we can't do it on this tour there isn't time when we do Vegas it's much more of a uh, you've got your hardcore fans coming that do know the stuff off on tour tonight, so you have an obligation to dig deep and play a few. You know, it, that was the fun part of doing it. it was a, we knew that for 11 nights we were going to go on stage at a certain time of night and play women, and we were going to go all the way through in sequence until we got to Don't Give Me Love and Affection. And uh, that could be mind-numbingly... Uh, creatively destructive to a band. <laughs> yeah. So the, the 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 counterpoint to that is like the 45 minutes where we own for ourselves would be different every night, and it was. So we never played the same set twice. We were bringing all sorts of mad songs in and out of set, and it didn't seem to upset the balance of what we were doing because there were so many people there that were going, "Oh my God!" You know. The the, 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 the one thing that did throw people was we do have this kind of joke within the band that there's. There's one guy that lives with his mom in the basement, and he criticizes your set list having never been to one of your gigs. You know, the internet crowd. And we yeah, thought, okay, <laughs> yeah, let's see. We call him Dorito Boy. Um, you know, this is a generic name uh, because he sits there eating them all day long and telling his mom to shut up, you know. And 
we played a song called Good Morning Freedom, which was a B-side of our first single in 1980. And when it went up on YouTube about four hours later, whoever posted it didn't even know what it was called. And we just punched the air and went, we win. You know, we've gone so deep, you don't even know this one. So don't ever accuse us of just playing Paul's and Sugar Me 40 times a night, because we don't do that. On this Kiss tour, it's hard to go mega deep, but even then, we're playing three songs off high and dry on this tour, you know. Um, we, uh, we're trying to vary it up as much as we can, but the Vegas thing really gives you the opportunity to, to play things that you don't normally play and we are looking forward to going back there it, it it was a good relationship with the hard rock um the people that run it like what we did we like being there so it kind of makes no sense not to do it again that's good news for vegas good news for rock fans here and everywhere let's bring it back full circle with your other band down and outs paying homage to ian hunter Mott the Hoople and related projects. There's a lot of great rock and roll like this, Joe, that you and I grew up with that's in danger of falling through the cracks in this digital age. So uh, way to go keeping some of that music alive with Down and Outs. Well, I appreciate that, Ron. You know, I mean, we can only do our own little bit. You can't keep everything alive. But I just chose my chosen charity, if you like, which is Mott the Hoople. But um, I'm enjoying it, and people seem to be digging it. So long may it last, you know. You got a new single just out, killer version of a really cool song called One of the Boys. Time for us to get to that. Thanks again for coming on the show. Safe travels. Joe Elliott on the streets of rock and roll. Thanks, Ron. The trifecta of Hall of Fame interviews, Vivian Campbell, Michael Bruce, and Joe Elliott. Howard Lease, you're next, dude. Thanks for listening, everyone. Let's do this again very soon. Yeah!